Hello, this is Lady Boulay, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Thank you for your thumbs up, for your comments, and thank you for sharing the videos. Thank you for all you do to support the channel. I want to follow up briefly on the video that I just did about why black Americans and Africans don't understand each other. And I played the video that the young Kenyan woman made, the Kenyan comedian, explaining why Africans and black Americans don't understand each other. I got a, a, a bit of pushback from Africans telling me all sorts of things. In that video, I also said that Africans who come here saying that white Americans treat them better than black Americans do are experiencing from white Americans the relationship that has been cultivated between black and white Americans over hundreds of years. They don't stand out as anybody special. They're doing the same things that we've been doing. There is nothing that Africans are doing in the United States that black Americans haven't already done. They are not blazing any real trails. In fact, black Americans are complaining that some Africans are coming over here perpetrating like they are descendants of slavery and trying to take advantage of things that are specifically designed for descendants of slavery. I also said that African immigrants to the United States should show more gratitude to black Americans than they do. And one commenter insisted that Africans don't owe black Americans any gratitude. Well, I will just point out for clarity that before the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which was passed along with other civil rights legislation, Africans could not immigrate. You could come here and go to school, but there was a policy that only Europeans, Eastern and Western Europeans, could come into this country as legal immigrants and become citizens. When you look at Ellis Island, all the way back to from the 1800s all up into the 19, probably 40 something, all you see is white people. On the screen you see immigration quotas based on national origin, annual quota for each fiscal year beginning July 1st, 1929. This list names the countries that people could immigrate to the United States from and it gave the quota the number of people from that country that could come into the United States. Now just looking down the quick list from Afghanistan all the way down to Cameroon not any African country is on that list and if you came from Cameroons you had to get permission or you had to come through the British or the French so you just couldn't come through the Cameroonian government. Further down the list is Egypt. A hundred people could come from Egypt. And Egypt was considered a white country at that time. And then under Egypt, you have Ethiopia. Ethiopia was the only African country below the Sahara Desert that could come to the United States in 1929 without getting clearance from a white government. And here they're calling it Abyssinia. And I'm looking on the other side and I don't see, I see Rwanda there and Burundi, which I guess is Burundi, and they could come under the Belgian government. This list is so long that I had to split it up. Liberia is on the list. 100 immigrants could come from Liberia. Liberia was a colony of the United States. The United States established Liberia for freed slaves who went back to Africa. South Africa and Rhodesia are on the list and they could come with the approval of the British government. And Togo could also come with British approval. Only 100 immigrants could come from any African country to the United States in 1929. And all but one of those countries, and that was Ethiopia, those people had to come with the permission of their white colonizers. And they may have been coming as servants to those European people. I don't know. I'll have to check and see. But I know that they were only coming if the colonizer gave approval. All except Ethiopia. And Ethiopians are the first Africans who were able to come to the United States as citizens of their own country. And the Ethiopians are some of the best, if not the best, 
African immigrants. They have been coming here the longest. They do not keep up mess. They don't do a whole lot of comparing themselves to us. Whatever they have to say, they say it among themselves. They have behaved in this country with class and dignity. The Ethiopians are very good immigrants to this country. So only Ethiopians could come to the United States as citizens of Ethiopia. Everybody else had to come through white colonizers. And that was it. Some may have been granted student visas. But when your course of study was up, you had a haul tail up out of here. And I will repeat myself for emphasis. The 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act was passed during the Civil Rights era when black Americans were fighting, getting beaten, tear gassed, jailed, and killed for civil rights legislation for America to open up this society for black people. One of the complaints of the civil rights era was that America would not let black people immigrate into this country. That was a part of the civil rights legislation. Black people were behind that legislation. Now Africans can come over here and argue back and forth, but the facts are what they are. I know what American law says, and I know who was and was not coming in this country based on what our laws say. The law tells you that. And based on what our elders said. And there's one good thing about white Americans. Whatever they do, they'll write it down. And if they feel strongly about it, they'll write it into law. So it's in the law books. You don't have to argue with anybody. This is what the law says. They did not want dark-skinned people in this country. Not Africans. Not Caribbeans. Not Indians. They didn't even want a lot of Asians into this country. That's the nature of the beast. I'm going to put a link in this video so you'll go back and look at it for yourself. In one of the comments that responded to the video, uh, somebody said that Africans had a diplomatic relationship with the United States and they come over here and they pay taxes. Just went on with the whole diatribe of nonsense because there was no diplomatic relationship between Africa, not black African countries, before 1965. And really none of them. Donald Trump pretty much summed it up. He called those African countries SHIT holes. That's pretty much what America thinks. And this is going to be another shocker for Africans, but it's usually the African American that's whispering into the president's ear, you need to go to Africa. You need to go to Brazil. President George W. Bush did not know that there were more black people in Brazil than there were in the United States. They don't have it like that when it comes to black people, especially Africans. There was no diplomatic relationship between any black African country, particularly, that would allow you to come over here and become a citizen, like you did after 1965. 1965 was the golden year for Africans coming to the United States. And I'm going to say it one more time. That was during civil rights legislation era. And lately, I've had Kenyans coming onto my channel saying that if it hadn't been for a Kenyan, we would never have had a first black president. Well, first of all, we didn't necessarily need a first black president, especially one that was just going to advocate for the status quo. We did not get reparations under the first black president. We've been here for hundreds of years without a first black president and we've had to fend for ourselves as we continue to do. He came here and got on our square. But I want to address that Kenyan father thing. President Obama's father was a deadbeat dad. He came to the United States to go to school. He got involved with President Obama's mother. She came up pregnant. Nobody knows what happened, whether they got married or not. What it looks like is that he abandoned his family. President Obama has that one picture of his father that he saw when he was about 10 years old. That was the first and only time that he saw his father. As far as I have been able to ascertain. So his father was really a non-factor in his life. The only reason that Kenyan father came up in President Obama's life is because he had gotten involved in big time American politics. And you have to establish a lineage when you're in American politics. He had his white grandparents that had raised him. 
that had educated him and had nurtured him into a decent human being. That was due to his white grandparents. And then he came to the United States and got on the African American square, American descendants of slavery. He jumped on our square. We didn't send for him. He did that because he knew that was the only way he was going to get ahead in American politics as a mixed race person. Kenya did not offer anything for President Obama. His father was a non-starter. That's all he was. Those white people nurtured him and educated him and cared for him and raised him into the man that he is. And then black Americans provided the familial foundation that he needed to support him. We were his support system. And then look what his brother did when President Obama was running for re-election in 2012. Donald Trump latched on to his, to his sorry brother. Donald Trump, who had postured himself as an enemy of President Obama, latched on to his brother. His sorry brother was running around talking about he supported Donald Trump wearing a Make America Great Again cap. Donald Trump invited him to the last presidential debate that President Obama was having with Mitt Romney and he had said he was coming and the only reason he didn't come was because he found out that he was going to have to get his own way home after the debate. No limousine was going to take him home. Is that what you're proud of? President Obama's Kenyan father was nothing but an embarrassment to him. He had to rise above that. And he did that with his white grandparents and the African-American family that he adopted. And again, we would have been fine without a first black president. Because we, that was the only one we've had and we're still here standing. But let's sum it up. The 1960s gave us three important pieces of civil rights legislation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which helps all Americans. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, which helps all Americans. And the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which allowed non-white people to immigrate to the United States and become citizens. So I just wanted to come back and clear that up. Now, we can have this argument as often as we want to, but the facts don't change. And these are the facts. And this is not about trying to make Africans like black Americans, because I think black Americans would be highly insulted if I was on here pandering or campaigning for somebody to like black Americans. So that's not what this is about. This is about somebody not being able to recognize when somebody else has done something nice for them. So I'll end with this. American descendants of slavery had to fight and struggle for every thing that has happened to us since slavery. And it has been grueling and it has been gruesome. But we haven't had anywhere to run to. We don't have anywhere to run to and flex and floss and brag and be arrogant. We have stayed here and we have made a life for ourselves here in the land of our captivity. To see people coming here bragging about what they're doing in somebody else's country, it just sounds it's weird. Why are you taking your talents and gifts all over the world when people are calling your countries assholes? Why aren't you staying at home and building your own countries and getting upset because somebody tells you that you couldn't even get it. If it hadn't been for them, you wouldn't even be able to come into that country, which is the truth. When it comes to America and when it comes to Western civilization, period, I believe that a lot of Africans are in denial about who people really are. And I can't change that here. But I will say this. I sympathize with African leaders because I believe some of them really want to be good leaders. I listen to them speaking. I listen to the concerns that they have for the continent. And I listen to them almost pleading to their people to stop running. I sympathize with them because a lot of their people don't seem to know who the enemy is. And when you don't know who your enemy is, there is no way that you can win the fight. And we are in a fight. But anyway, we'll leave it at that. Let me know what you think about the video. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to the channel. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Share the video. And as always, have a great day.